As the rhetorical tit for tat heats up between Beijing and Washington, observers are getting more anxious about the future of China US relations. As the world grapples with COVID 19 and economic slowdown, can China and the US stop their hostility? We'll be talking to Mr. Jia Qingguo, former dean of School of International Studies at Peking University. And in the second half of our program, we'll be joined by Professor John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan. Um, Professor Jia, I guess this is a million dollar question. How can the current downward spiral in U.S. China relations be stopped? I think it's very difficult, uh, but it's not impossible. Uh, what it requires is uh, the people in both Washington and Beijing uh, take a pause and cool down and try to uh, pragmatically assess the interests, uh, their interests in the relationship and take some pragmatic measures to uh, uh, deal with each other, uh, like holding uh, some kind of uh, dialogues over uh, a range of issues to identify their interests and uh, areas where they can cooperate, and also the conflicts, how they can uh, take measures to control those conflicts, to manage those conflicts. In this way, we may be able to arrest the trend of deterioration of the relationship. Uh, you talked about deterioration. Uh, it looks to many that um, bilateral relations have been steadily deteriorating ever since uh, 2017, 2018. What do you think plays the biggest part in the deterioration? Is it the leaders or domestic political dynamics on both sides or an evolving international order? I think a lot of factors have contributed to this. First of all, I think the rise of China has acerbated uh, a lot of pre-existing differences and tensions. Uh, what used to be uh, a, a minor uh, thing now uh, is becoming a big issue. Uh, like ideology, ideological difference used to be manageable. Uh, now, uh, you know, it's regarded as a big threat, uh, especially by on the part of the U.S. Also, the divergent political developments uh, have uh, led to a lot of uh, frustration, especially on the part of the U.S., uh, the, the, uh, the liberals. Uh, they think that China is becoming a different country, and uh, the previous policy of engagement has failed. So it's uh, time to use a different tactic to deal with China, that is to be tough on China. And of course the Trump factor is very important. Uh, uh, he has uh, been uh, very uncertain uh, in his beha behavior, uh, in his policy, and also some people he hire uh, are ideologically uh, very uh, uh, extreme. And, and also, they, they don't like China, uh, so they have been advocating some very uh, tough and also Cold War-like policies. And of course, the age of Internet has also further contributed to this. A lot of uh, extreme people on both sides on the Internet, they interact with, with each other, creating a, a terrible atmosphere for, or poisonous atmosphere for the relationship. And then um, you talk about uh, anti-China sentiment. Um, you know, when we think about uh, visa restrictions targeting Chinese students recently, uh, when you think about, um, you know, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, uh, a group of uh, U.S. congressmen labeling Chinese educational programs as influence campaigns, um, and also the media coverage, do you think that is mounting to a new red scare? of the 21st century in Washington? Well, it's becoming more and more like one. Uh, it's like uh, the U.S. returns to the McCarthy period on China. Uh, anybody 
who is uh, who who tries to be more pragmatic and realistic in uh, in in policy uh, suggestions would be condemned as pro-China or panda hug, panda hugger, um, and they securitize everything, uh, economy, you know. Uh, whatever you import from China uh, represents a security risk. Uh, whatever you sell to China is a security risk. And people-to-people -people exchange is also regarded in terms of security. Uh, you know, the Chinese scholars and students are likely spies uh, to these people. Uh, so they fan up fear and uh, hostility between Chinese people and the American people. Uh, I think this is a, a, a terrible thing uh, that's happening. Uh, hopefully, uh, their you know, extreme voices uh, will be uh, stopped. Well, Professor Jia, from Washington's perspective, um, China is also changing. China has been changing. Um, they talked about Beijing's domestic programs, domestic polit policies as increasingly um, strict and less liberal, um, you know, according to them, and they perceive China's foreign policy as increasingly aggressive, and that those are the reasons cited by the hardliners in Washington uh, for a more, uh, you know, aggressive, uh, you know, containment policy against China. Are Washington's concerns legitimate at all? Well, China certainly uh, has been developing. Uh, not in the direction of what the liberals in the U.S. had hoped. Uh, that, to some extent, explains why they, they have been disappointed. Uh, but China has its own uh, issue to, to tackle with. China has its own way to deal with things. Um, they cannot be the same. Uh, so I think uh, Americans have to be more uh, tolerant, uh, more pragmatic uh, in dealing with uh, different practices. China has its own situations. Uh, they are not the same kind of the U.S., so they cannot adopt the U.S. Uh, system. Uh, but of course, China can do better. Uh, and uh, also, China's external behavior, uh, I think mostly, uh, it hasn't changed that much except the style. Uh, uh, for example, on the South China Sea, China has not claimed new, uh, new uh, territories or territorial waters. Uh, China's claims there have been there all the time uh, since the 50s. Uh, so uh, China's claims have not changed. But then, in recent years, China has become more capable. Uh, so a lot of people in China say to the Chinese government, look, um, in the past, you told us uh, you could not do anything about our disputed territories uh, uh, because we are weak. Uh, now we are not that weak anymore, so you have to do something. Uh, so China, Chinese government has been more proactive in defending what Chinese uh, people believe uh, their legitimate rights, um, but but this is interpreted by uh, people in Washington as uh, uh, you know uh, China's uh, uh, part of China's grand strategy of uh, territorial expansion, and um, so to them they think that uh, when the big country uh, economy develops. Uh, that country will become expansionist, and, and they, they see this as an exact, uh, 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 early sign of Chinese uh, territorial expansion. I think it's more a uh, kind of uh, imagination than reality. Uh, I don't think China has a grand strategy of territorial expansion. China just hope uh, that uh, its legitimate interests and rights are protected. Right, many call this uh, mirror imaging. Uh, you're projecting your own, fe your own fears and thoughts onto your, uh, your next uh, closest rival. Uh, let's talk about Taiwan, Professor Jia. Um, you know, Washington has, uh, you know, um, passed legislations, uh, Taiwan Travel Act, um, uh, 
calling for closer ties, uh, government exchanges between Taipei and Washington. Um, you know, U.S. military has been sending their aircraft carriers through the Taiwan Strait at the frequency of once a month, and it used to be once a year. How far do you think Washington is willing to go to challenge Beijing's bottom line on the issue of Taiwan? That's a very uh, dynamic situation. Uh, I think Washington, uh, especially the Congress, uh, is now in a sort of emotional mood. Uh, they, uh, if there is a consensus, you know, they, this is a very di politically, you know, diverse uh, Congress. Uh, you have uh, all kinds of different views. If they have one consensus uh, that is uh, on China, okay. so uh, the Congress in recent years have passed legislation after legislation uh, with uh, uh, absolute majority or even unanimity. Uh, this, uh, like the Taiwan bills, uh, other legislations against China. Um, the Taiwan issue is the most sensitive political issue between China and the United States. The only reason, the most important reason, China and the United States could not establish diplomatic relations during the first 20 years after the founding of the PRC is Taiwan. And the only reason that we could establish diplomatic relations uh, in 1979 it's because we settled the problems of Taiwan, the most essential problems of Taiwan. Okay. Now, uh, after uh, the, the, through the, uh, the normalization communique, the Shanghai communique, and the normalization communique, and, and then later in 1982, the, uh, the, the communique on uh, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. Uh, the U.S. has Successive administrations have abided by these communiques, the principles of one China, uh, or at least uh, in the U.S. term, it's one China policy. Uh, that, to some extent, explains why uh, the Taiwan Strait has been relatively peaceful and quiet. Uh, and also, China-U.S. relationship uh, is still uh, uh, normal. If the, 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 but under the, this administration, uh, the situation is changing, uh, especially the Congress. Uh, if the administration uh, adopt uh, or put the uh, congressional resolutions on Taiwan into practice, then I think we would have mm -hmm. uh, a terrible situation in the Taiwan Strait. And also, China-U.S. relationship may be in danger. I mean, diplomatic relationship. Uh, so Sir, it's a yeah. very dangerous situation. Uh, the the people in Washington uh, in power, uh, they are not that, you know, aware of how much danger it is uh, to to play with this. But it seems to me that some people. Maybe they are too young or too ideologically biased. Uh, they want to play with it. Well, um, to be honest with you, when I was in Washington, based uh, over there as a correspondent for eight years, when I talk about the, the Taiwan issue, uh, some of my American friends are like, uh, oh, Taiwan, I love Thai food. You know, they think uh, they can really distinguish Taiwan <laughs> and Thailand. Um, really, that says a lot about um, how much average Americans understand the issue of Taiwan. Um, I want to thank, thank you so very much, um, Professor Jia Qingguo, former Dean of School of International Studies from Peking University. Thank you so much for your perspectives. Coming up next, we'll be talking to Professor John Mearsmeyer from the University of Chicago. Stay with us. <music> Professor Mearsmeyer, um, many are wondering um, to what extent, to what point Will U.S.-China relationship deteriorate? Will there be an all-out confrontation, for example? Well, I think that there's going to be an intense security competition. You already see evidence of that. 
And that intense security competition will have two dimensions. One will be an economic dimension. Uh, this will involve a trade war and a technology war. Uh, and in addition to that economic competition, there'll be military competition. This is what the pivot to Asia was all about. It's all about taking American military forces uh, and moving them uh, in larger numbers to East Asia. Of course, we'd already had military forces in East Asia, but we're going to increase our forces there. Uh, and the Americans are going to try and put together a balancing coalition against China. Uh, they're going to try and find allies in the region and work with those allies, all for the purposes of containing China. Now, the $64,000 question at this point in time is whether or not we go beyond the security competition and there's actually a shooting war between the two sides. Uh, I do not think that's likely, but I do think it's possible. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the South China Sea today, for example, uh, where the United States and the Chinese militaries are more or less eyeball to eyeball, and there is always a possibility that shooting would break out between the forces on the two sides, uh, there's a lot of cause for concern. I, I think that the situation between China and the United States today is dangerous. Well, as a renowned professor and um, scholar and also proponent of offensive realism, I assume that you don't think China and the U.S. can escape the Thucydides trap of great power rivalry. Uh, am I wrong? No, I've argued since the early 2000s that... Uh, China, as it continued to rise, and the United States were destined to be in the situation that they're in today. Uh, I think that as China got more powerful economically, uh, it would translate that economic might into military might, and that it would try to dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. China would try to become a regional hegemon. And I've long argued that from China's point of view, that makes eminently good sense. You don't want to be weak. You want to be the most powerful state in your region of the world. And if you're China, you certainly don't want the United States military on your doorstep. Uh, the United States does not want the Chinese military in the Caribbean Sea or in Mexico or in Canada. Uh, the United States has this thing called the Monroe Doctrine. It tells countries like China and Germany and Russia to stay out of the Western Hemisphere. Well, I think from China's point of view, it makes eminently good sense to get the American military out of East Asia uh, and for China to be much more powerful than all its neighbors. Surely all the Chinese remember what happened when China was weak. Uh, the end result is what you call the century of national humiliation. You never want to let that happen again. You want to be really powerful. So you'll try and dominate Asia. And I don't blame Chinese leaders and the Chinese people for wanting to dominate Asia. But at the same time, you have to understand that from a strategic point of view, the United States has a deep-seated interest in making sure that China does not dominate Asia. But do you think China has ambition or aspiration to dominate, let's say, Eurasia? Um, you know, you heard about these accusations of China practicing neocolonialism in Africa and nowadays even uh, in South America. America. You know, those accusations come from, namely, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and many U.S. politicians. No, I don't think that China is bent on uh, neocolonialism in Africa or, uh, or it's bent on dominating Europe. It, it can't dominate Europe. Europe is too far away. I'm talking about Eurasia and South America. Sorry. Uh, even South America. Uh, the Chinese would be foolish in the extreme to try to dominate South America. The United States would definitely contest them there. But that's the accusation uh, of many Washington politicians. Well, they can make those accusations, but they're foolish accusations. Washington politicians often make foolish accusations. What China is going to try to do is, number one, dominate Asia. And then, number two, it's going to develop significant power projection capability so it can protect its interests in places like the Persian Gulf and in Africa. But it's not going to dominate the Persian Gulf or dominate Africa. It's just going to have a lot of military force that can be used in those regions, again, to protect uh, China's interests. 
you talk about the potential military clash in the South China Sea, um, but in the book Conventional Deterrence, you said deterrence is likely to work when the potential attacker believes the attack will be costly and unlikely to be successful. Uh, don't you think that's exactly the case with China? Uh, think about China's nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities. Do you think the U.S. Uh, is that willing to engage in a military conflict with China? Well, I think that you're right, that it's hard to see either the Chinese or the Americans winning a quick and decisive military victory in the South China Sea or over Taiwan or in the East China Sea at this particular point in time. Uh, I think that's the case. And as I argued in conventional deterrence, if a state does not think it can win a quick and decisive victory, uh, it's not likely to attack. The problem is it's easy to imagine a small scale crisis breaking out in the South China Sea or a crisis breaking out over Taiwan that then escalates. Uh, there'll be limits to how much it can escalate because of the presence of nuclear weapons on both sides. But I would not be surprised, again, I don't think it's likely, but I would not be surprised if, for example, uh, some American naval ships and some Chinese naval ships ended up shooting at each other in the South China Sea and that that began to escalate. Now, one could argue that it won't escalate too far because both sides will realize that they can't win, at least at this point in time. And therefore, you may have a limited conflict, but that will be the end of it. I would also note, though, and you don't want to underestimate this, if China continues to grow economically and therefore militarily, it will eventually be powerful enough in East Asia that it might very well think that it can win a quick and decisive victory, especially over Taiwan. You know, you can hypothesize a situation where 20, 30 years from now, China is much more powerful relative to the United States than it is today. And it then has the capability to win a quick and decisive victory over Taiwan. So even though you can't win a quick and decisive victory now uh, against the United States and almost all contingencies, the future may be different. All right, uh, let's talk about the post-pandemic world. Do you think as countries emerge from COVID-19, uh, will there be more borders, conservatism, nationalism, um, you know, looking in, nations looking inward, or will this pandemic actually compel countries to cooperate and working with each other more? Well, this is actually one of the big debates of the day. And a lot of people believe that because uh, the pandemic is transnational, it crosses borders, it doesn't discriminate between China or the United States, uh, that we have a vested interest in all working together uh, to, uh, to combat uh, this virus or any future viruses that uh, we run into. Uh, there's no question that there's going to be some cooperation uh, in the future uh, that comes out of this crisis. Uh, there, is, there are all sorts of incentives for every state to work together, but they're more powerful incentives uh, pushing in the direction of nationalism. Uh, when you get a crisis like this, states basically hunker down. Uh, the, the, the concept of the nation state, which is at the heart of nationalism, is reinforced. People view themselves as part of a tribe, and we have to take care of everybody in that tribe. Uh, so I think nationalism, which was picking up steam, it was becoming an increasingly powerful force uh, in the West, especially uh, before uh, COVID-19 is now uh, likely to become an even more powerful force. Again, this is not to say you won't have any cooperation, but I think that cooperation uh, will be dwarfed in very important ways uh, by the growth of nationalism, which means an influence on things like borders, sovereignty, and so forth and so on. And then how would you characterize President Donald Trump's foreign policy? Uh, is it principled realism, as some members of the cabinet uh, described it? Well, I, I would say there's nothing principled about President Trump's foreign policy. Uh, I think liberal hegemony, which was the foreign policy that we pursued, we meaning the Americans pursued during the Cold War, uh, was based on principles, 
uh, it was a failed policy, but nevertheless based on principles. Uh, I think that the Trump administration's foreign policy uh, is much different. Uh, what's happened with President Trump is, is that great power politics has come back into play. You want to remember that during the Clinton administration, the George W. Bush administration, and the Obama administration, the United States was the unipol. We operated in a unipolar system. This was a time when relations between the United States and China were very good because during the unipolar moment, China was not a challenge to the United States. But by the time President Trump took office in January of 2017, the world had effectively stopped being unipolar and it was multipolar. And it was multipolar because China had risen to the point where it was clearly a great power. And Russia under Putin, Vladimir Putin, had come back from the dead. And Russia was now once again a great power. So we transitioned from a unipolar to a multipolar world. This is roughly around 2016, 2017. And this had nothing to do with President Trump. It happened independent of him. But the fact is that he recognized, and anybody else who was sitting in the White House would have recognized, that the United States now has to concentrate on thinking about how to deal with those two other great powers in the system, because we're not in unipolarity. You have to think about how to deal with China and how to deal with Russia. And of course, once you start thinking along those lines, you begin to drift into a realist world. And this is what you see happening with President Trump. He's interested in containing Russia, and he's interested in simultaneously containing China. Uh, one final question we have about one minute left, Professor. Um, do you think COVID-19 will change globalization as we know it? No, I don't think it'll have much effect on globalization. As I said before, I think it'll reinforce nationalism. But I think globalization as we knew it uh, in the 1990s and in the early 2000s is gone. It, it's not coming back. Now, this is terrible news for the Chinese because the Chinese love globalization. You love joining the WTO. You did very well in that global order that existed uh, during the unipolar moment. Uh, but that moment is gone. And President Trump, you want to remember, was elected running against globalization. President Trump argued that globalization was hurting the United States and helping not only countries like China, but our close allies like Germany, South Korea, and Japan at our expense. And whether you agree with him or not, he got elected. And he has acted as if globalization uh, is an enemy of the United States. So there's no evidence that uh, we're going back uh, to the liberal international order uh, that existed in the unipolar moment. Professor John Mearsmeyer, Professor of Political Science at University of Chicago, thank you so much for your insight. It was an honor to have you with us. And that will do it for this edition of Dialogue. I want to thank our viewers in China and around the world for tuning in. I'm Wang Guan. Thank you.